Today is Super Tuesday here in Virginia at the time of this recording. It'll be about a week after by the time this episode's released, but I just came back from work, and before that, I was going to the polls. I voted for... That was very anticlimactic. <laughs> voted for my guy, Ron DeSantis. Um, and yes, I will be supporting Trump in the general, but I want to be able to say that I supported... Uh, I was able to vote for President Ron... Uh, vote for presidential candidate Ron DeSantis if he doesn't run again in 2028. But now... Yes, I admit it's time to get on to the general. Um, I don't know if the flag's coming down because I don't have a better background, but yeah. I will be supporting Trump unless he does something major to lose my support, which would be hard to do admittedly against Joe Biden. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Let's get into the actual episode. Today, I am talking to a guy who I've wanted to talk to for a very long time. It's an extremely exciting episode. That would be Mr. John J. Dwyer, a Civil War historian and adventure fiction author and it's gonna be a fantastic time today stick around we're going to talk about some uh news uh articles in relation to the civil war and how they tie into society today and talk about civil war history and some of the misconceptions about it as a whole hope you enjoy stick around for fight and revive with adam boyer america is no longer one nation under god are you ready to fight for a revival well then you've come to the right place welcome to fight and revive with adam boyer Well, thank you, Mr. Dwyer, for coming on to the show. Um, so, obviously, you are a Civil War historian and adventure novel writer and uh, a lot more. So, uh, if you would, could you tell us a little about the history books you've read and then anything else you want to contribute uh, as we get started here about your uh, your career as an author? Sure, Adam. Well, when I'm asked that question, it really, my story uh, uh, related to history it's kind of a lifelong story. You know, I was raised in a home. Uh, my father died when I was two. My younger brother was six weeks old, uh, a heart attack at a young age. Um, experiences he had in World War II in the Pacific contributed to that. Uh, so th there was like this empty chair at the table, literally and figuratively, uh, that was always there as we were growing up. But, but our mother was a real patriot, uh, she had so much pride in our country, you know, in our father and in our heritage that, uh, you know, we were raised, you know, part of our mother's milk was uh, hit, learning history and heroes, especially from the American uh, context and point of view. So, uh, you know, very early on, I mean, probably I was probably five or six years old. I already had John Wayne's Davy Crockett Republic speech memorized long before I ever saw the movie, just listening to it over and over again on the old 33 RPM soundtrack Alamo, uh, soundtrack album of the Alamo. And so, you know, a young person, older folks don't realize that a little person, when they're taking stuff in, whatever it is, good or bad, that's making an imprint on, on the future person. So you see now John Dwyer that's got all these books written and, you know, all these things I've done history wise, uh, it's just the, the continuation of that little boy that was uh, learning about uh, uh, courage, about honor, valor, loyalty, things like that through the heroes that uh, uh, in my generation that we were uh, you know, constantly exposed to both in the books, the movies, the TV shows, you know, the idea of an anti-hero that was kind of a bad person that occasionally did something good and then you call him you know, the hero, that wasn't really how they did it back then. It was people that overcame uh, real challenges, uh, you know, real snares and difficulties, uh, didn't always necessarily want to do uh, what they had to do, but they did it anyway. So that was getting impressed on my character as a little boy. So henceforth, I grow up and, you know, uh, I became a Christian in my mid to late 20s. Uh, I had been given by God um, an aptitude for writing and an interest in history, and uh, I had some early success in that. I got a, a partial journalism scholarship to the University of Oklahoma, but uh, I was not a Christian. I was not walking with the Lord, and gradually as I look back, Adam, the Lord kind of turned off the spigot, that creative fountain of imagination and, uh, you know, uh, uh, creativity until uh, I became a Christian. And then it came on again. And I began to get flooded with these ideas 
first, I didn't even know what they were. Looking back, it was ideas for stories. Uh, they were initially just coming into my mind, characters and scenes and actions that were basically story ideas and flows and themes. But uh, that was in 1984 when that first started, when I became a Christian. And my first book didn't come out until 1998. So that shows how I would just encourage all of our listeners to to be patient, uh, especially if you feel like God's got a mission for you, giving you a calling, giving you talents and gifts. Uh, he does it on his own timetable. And a lot of times he'll have us wait a lot longer than we think we would like to wait. But then once he kicks into gear, at least as we see it, uh, you better fasten your seatbelt because he moves a lot faster than we do. And that's what happened in 1998. My first book came out, Stonewall, a historical novel about Stonewall Jackson. And man, that just, uh, that that opened up so many things. It, it led to a sequel, which was called Robert E. Lee, uh, Brahman and Holman, uh, which was the Southern Baptist Convention publishing house at the time, better known now as Lifeway. Um, that Stonewall book really hit a chord because uh, there weren't that many books back then that were written from Christian publishing houses uh, most of them were books that women liked and they had good messages and all, but they didn't have that many books that really interested men. And this was a book that was a, you know, rock'em, sock'em, you know, blood and thunder history. It, it had a one of America's greatest military leaders, but, but yet who was a devout Christian who led one of the greatest religious revivals in American history uh, in the Southern armies during the war between the states which, of course, is left out of typical American history books because it's politically incorrect from just about every direction. But that book uh, struck a chord, and Brahman Holman said, hey, can we do a sequel? Because the Stonewall book uh, left off right before Gettysburg uh, at the Battle of Chancellors Chancellorsville, of course, and then the Lee book picked up right before Gettysburg, moved forward. That also led, ultimately, uh, Stonewall came out in 1998, the Lee book 2002. In 2005, after you know five and a half years of work focused on the war between the states, America's Uncivil War, those early historical novels led to a lot of people uh, asking me, you know, what's a good, trustworthy book on that war uh, that's not just written, you know, uh, politically correct, trying to assuage modern elite notions. And so I kept looking around. We found some that were good, but none that really had a comprehensive approach. And finally, a couple of guys, pastors uh, in Louisiana and Tennessee that I really respected, they said, well, you know, apparently that book hadn't been written yet. Why don't you write it? <laughs> so that's what led to the war between the states. Uh, that I know you and your family uh, read in, as part of your education. Uh, now here we are, uh, almost 20 years later. That book's in its fifth edition. Uh, Adam, a few months ago, I had a woman that had ordered several copies for her children. She's from Missouri, and she said that when she was a girl, her mom uh, read that book and took, uh, took her and her siblings through that book, uh, and she never forgot it, and and determined as like a 12 or 13 year old when she grew up, she was going to have read it and teach it to her children. So lo and behold, here we are. Uh, you know, you think when you're young that uh, you won't get old or that time won't pass, but here we are uh, already into the second generation, literally of people that are reading this book that are teaching, sharing and learning the principles from it. That's extremely cool. I'm, I'm, so glad you mentioned that because yes, that is kind of like the the book that stands out the most um, when I, when I think of, of your works is the War Between the States and it's a great book. I highly recommend our viewers check it out. Um, so just as we get into this a little bit, I don't want to take up too much time. So like you can take a minute or two to answer this, but just um, I had someone ask me this. I, I said, you know, I'm about to do this interview. Would you like me to ask anything specific? Because he is a fellow, um, you know, Civil War history connoisseur, so to speak. And he wanted to know what, in your opinion, are some of those common misconceptions about the Civil War? Sure. Great question. And, you know, I wish I had the first edition of the War Between the States, America's Uncivil War, in front of me, Adam, because uh, those that have that first edition, on the back cover, uh, we had a, uh, a question that said, did you know? And then there was this list of, of, uh, of statements about some of the most uh, 
uh, in some cases, uh, misperceptions of the war, in some cases, just things that nobody knew. But I think those kind of, I, I think I can remember a few of them. For instance, did you know that, uh, you know, a third of the, of the slaveholding states uh, at the time of that war fought on the side of the Union? That's the North. People go, what? Uh, it was all about the North freed the slaves from the South. Well, that's funny because uh, yeah. at least a year into the war, wasn't even a state. It was uh, Washington, D.C. There yep. were still slave auctions going on blocks from the White House. Uh, and then five of the 15 uh, states in the North had Correct. had uh, slavery was allowed, was uh, legal during the uh, extent of that war. Uh, don't know the exact percent, but... Uh, no more than 25 percent, probably closer to 10 percent. That's close to one out of every 10. That's all the Confederate soldiers that ever owned even one slave. So this idea that the South, you know, this, this great uh, rising of Southern manhood that rose up to smite down another race, you know, uh, a very small percentage of the soldiers of the South ever had their own slave. And uh, I think it's the height of foolishness to say, even though Hollywood likes to suggest it in different ways, uh, they're wrong on that as they usually are. Uh, the idea that a bunch of uh, people of the land, yeoman farmers and people that, uh, that were pretty much scratching out a living, most of them for their own families, uh, would go and sacrifice not just you know the fathers and the leaders of the family, the patriarchs, but their boys, you know, their teenagers, to uh, keep some other rich, some rich guy, uh, the ability to hold his slaves yeah. is just ridiculous. Um, anyhow, so there are, you know, another thing is the Confederate battle flag, you know, the much maligned, and of course, in some of the events that have happened in recent American history, uh, the elites, the woke, all the great institutions, and let's admit it, let's face it, all the great institutions of America have been and infected and have been corrupted to the nth degree. Uh, I mean, I used to think, well, this one still was sold on that one. Well, in the last few years, uh, going through yes. the pandemic, uh, you look at whether it's the media, entertainment industry, big business, which was right, as always supposedly the, uh, the, the friend of the conservative and the Republican and all that, <laughs> but big business, uh, big technology, high tech, uh, right. Even the sports world, you know, even all the big shots that make all the millions of dollars, the coaches and the athletes, uh, they're arrayed against uh, the principles That's of true. America's founding fathers. And I like to say founding grandfathers. We revere and love the Washingtons and the Jeffersons, uh, the Madisons, the Henrys. And I don't only talk about them in the war between the states. I talk about them in my state history books. Uh, about Oklahoma, the Oklahomans, Volume One and Two. Uh, those of you that are have any connection to Oklahoma, or just like a a rip roaring history book read full of pictures. Uh, the head of the Oklahoma uh, Historical Society, uh, the state history you know organization, came to me and after the war between the states came out, Adam and he said, "Can you write a book like this about Oklahoma?" He was referring to the war between the states. So I'm saying all that because. Um, when you look at how uh, things have progressed in these recent years, uh, there are all these great institutions, once great institutions, are aligned against what our founding fathers, and I was saying in my multiple of my books I talk about, but our founding grandfathers, the Pilgrims and the Puritans, you know, the Brewsters and the Bradfords and these guys, that the Witherspoons, the, the Winthrops, mm. that said we're going to yeah. establish a city on a hill that will be a light to all the nations. Now, who ever heard of a country that it, even before it became a country by the people that founded the civilization it came from was already worried about blessing all the other countries. You know, Europe, besides us, was probably the best of the countries as far as advance and, you know, accomplishments yeah. and all. And all they ever did was try to just carve a larger piece of their mercantile pie for themselves at the expense of others. So we have a great heritage. And uh, there are a lot of people out there, including the people watching your program, uh, that COVID did us a lot of favors. You know, sad things happened during the pandemic, but a lot of good things happened. And one of the things that happened that was great was a lot of people got the blinders taken off, realized we are being lied to. And I left out Big Pharma, by the way, I think a while ago, the entire medical industry that's been corrupted. Yeah. Uh, you know, these 
charities and hospitals that used to, yes. you know, in Oklahoma, we have yep. Mercy and St. Anthony's and some of these. Think about that. Uh, most of these groups are now owned by corporate conglomerates back east that have no concern uh, that the people that wrote the Hippocratic Oath did about the welfare of the patient. It's all uh, given money to their, sh their stockholders, their shareholders. Mm -hmm. So you've got an audience that wants to hear the truth. The pandemic broadened that audience. It opened a lot of folks' eyes. We know we're being lied to now. We know we're on our own with God, of course. We can't depend on the institutions of this country anymore. But the young people like yourself, the young adults, that's who people like myself, I need to be pouring my life into. So for one thing, you can rise up and do a better job than we have in this country. Well, thank you. Yes, yeah, so much for that. Um I've said um, in the past, you know, the saying is that those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat its mistakes. Paraphrasing, you know, there's a couple different ways of saying that phrase, but, you know, to, to most that's a warning, but I've said that for the modern left, that's their motto, not a warning. So, in one of the ways they are um, participating in the erasure of American history is by taking down our statues, our monuments, they've completely taken over the public school system so they can control the history curriculum if history is even taught there. Um, so obviously today's interview is centered around the Civil War. Um, to gain some insight as to why this is again in the news, I'm going to read this uh, excerpt from an article from Fox News. It said, quote, The Reconciliation Monument, known as the Confederate Statue, is part of the push to remove military installations named after the Confederacy in the week of the summer of 2020, in the wake, sorry, of the summer 2020 Black Lives Matter protests. According to a press release from the National Cemetery, the statue will be removed from the cemetery by December 22nd. This is a little bit of an older article. This did happen already. Uh, the move to remove all the statues in compliance with the congressional mandate to remove all Confederate memorials by January 1st, 2024. So that's come and gone now. Uh, the congressional mandate passed in 2020 declared that the Department of Defense must remove all names, symbols, displays, monuments, etc., that honor or commemorate the CSA, Confederate States of America. Um, so obviously we've seen a lot of this kind of stuff happening in 2020 especially, but efforts continue to be underway, um, whether that be on social media or more tangibly, you know, to remove more statues, even those on private land, wherever. And there's a lot of that around here because now I'm pretty close to Appomattox. Um, but there's a lot of effort still underway to erase any memory of the Confederacy from American history. So. Why, in your opinion, I know this is a really big question, but why, in your opinion, is that just not a good idea? Well, great question, Adam. And by the way, that as a lead into that answer, something that I probably should have mentioned a moment ago, this idea of erasing real history. Uh, one of the reasons the war between the states, America's uncivil war, uh, and by the way, uh, our website, I think a lot of your folks know it, it's just my name.com, John J. Dwyer, middle initial J, D W Y E R. You can get lots of information on the book there, or you can get it at your bookstores, uh, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, and so forth. Um, but the first third of that book talks about all the many reasons for the war between the states. Slavery was involved, uh, obviously, but it was not the reason that that war occurred. I kind of got at that a moment ago as far as how uh, the breakdown was a lot, was very surprising on who who held slaves and who supported it legally and so forth. But economics and uh, the, the form of government and the heritage of our constitutional republic, there were so many, for instance, out here in uh, Oklahoma, you had the, the uh, tribes, the Cherokees and the Seminoles, Creeks, Ch uh, Chickasaws, Choctaws, these great Indian republics that came east on the uh, west on the Trail of Tears, uh, they had slaveholders on both sides of those tribes, th those that went with the north and those that went with the south. Uh, most of them went with the south and they didn't do it primarily to keep their slaves. They had a lot of other reasons. But that kind of leads into your question, which is this idea of erasing history and just, you know, uh, painting over the edifice of a huge event, uh, of a, a landmark event in the nation's history, like the war between the states. Uh, that's one way you do it. You just paint over it a different color, and then the truth is under it. You paint over your own uh, truth, your own uh, rendering of history, and those that come along after that never know what's under the fake coat and what was really under there for real. And, of course, this idea that's gained steam in recent years 
with this nexus of media, uh, entertainment, academy, and so forth, uh, to force people to think one way and to say, oh, well, no, we're not being unfair. Uh, we're just, but we're not allowing, you know, we have a moral duty to not allow wicked opinions to be heard. Well, what's the difference between uh, only allowing one viewpoint and then going a step further and erasing other viewpoints and the people that hold them? What's the difference between that and what the Jacobins did in Fr the French revolutionaries uh, when they overthrew France in the late 1780s? Uh, that was a communist revolution. And you'll remember that one of the things that happened not long after they succeeded was uh, Robespierre and a lot of these guys that led the, the this massive uh, lynch mob in France, they had their own heads being delivered on platters. So that's the idea that, you know, our founding fathers knew that a pure democracy, I think, was it Madison or Adams said it's the worst form of government because uh, what, since when would you want 50.1% of any group deciding uh, on a whim, on their viewpoint, on their mood that particular day, what the law is. So we had a constitutional republic was how we were set up with rep with spheres of influence. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, spheres of influence, uh, silos of vertical, horizontal, many different uh, uh, PowerPoints to where there was no one person or group that was supposed to be able to control a nation. But I say all of that because in recent years, it's become more and more uh, like communism, I haven't even mentioned the Soviet Union, China, the great practitioners of that. If you look north across our border, I'm sure you probably have some uh, patriot listeners in Canada. You want to see how, how it would look like if it gets a little bit worse in this country, uh, some of the horrible things going on in Canada. And I don't know how you could say that Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, these one, gr once great countries, are, are much different from not just a socialist, but a communist country, because the communists, you know, socialists is you have maybe a rather radical political and economic viewpoint. To me, communism has always been when you enforce that with the barrel of a gun. And I don't know what the difference between that is and threatening people, taking their livelihood away from them, putting in, them in prison, as happens in all those countries I just mentioned now, if they don't tow the party line. So we need to not forget our history um, you know, I thought it was very interesting. One more point on your question there. Uh, a few years ago, when they started tearing down statues of Robert E. Lee around the time of the Charlottesville tragedy, uh, and I remember telling folks, hey, be careful. Uh, today, uh, you know, my Lee today will tomorrow be uh, your Washington or your Jefferson uh, or your Columbus. Well, even I underestimated it, Adam, because who knew that uh, Ulysses S. Grant and Abraham Lincoln would be getting torn down in 2020 as exemplars of this totalitarian society that we are, this racist, misogynist, you know, evil empire. Who could have predicted that Frederick Douglass himself would be torn down off his pedestal, literally the, the statue, and, and thrown into the river outside Rochester, New York? So I rest my case on that one. It's a foolish thing to erase history and not learn from it. I completely agree. So most people have the idea of, you know, when it comes to the statues thing, well, you know, if they if they get this far with their argument, they get to, you know, well, monuments to, you know, to Hitler aren't allowed because, you know, he he killed the Jews and the Confederates were just a bunch of a slave owning racists anyway that that only left the Union so they could keep enslaving and abusing black people. So it's fine to remove their statues. So obviously there's a as you touched on already, there's a lot more to why the Confederacy succeeded in that, and a lot of the great Confederates did not even own slaves, such as Robert E. Lee, who freed his slaves. But there's a ton to say on this topic, but basically, how would you respond to that argument? Sure. Well, I think, again, it's a slippery and perilous slope to go down to decide that uh, your view, it's one thing to hold a view, and, and that's one of the beauties of our of our constitutional republic is you know, I have friends that have uh, that are not Christians, friends that have liberal uh, political views, social views, economic views. But, uh, you know, they have the right to hold those views. I may not want them teaching my child, my grandchild. Uh, I may not want them in a position of power and influence. But, hey, I'm not going to do something violent 
or underhanded to keep them from that. I'm going to work within the system or I'm going to, you know, shop elsewhere, if you will, and uh, go to other uh, modes of information, other sources. Uh, so the idea that uh, uh, I think what it gets back to is that uh, we are supposedly a land that uh, uh, values the opinions of all. And some opinions have more impact. Some opinions have more influence. But to just terminate certain opinions, to cancel, I think that's the term that's used these days, to cancel uh, certain lines of thought uh, is, is, a, is a perilous slope to go down because, and I would say this to those that might be listening right now that are not necessarily great sympathizers with Confederacy, uh, I would say, uh, have you noticed that uh, it's not just Robert E. Lee or Stonewall Jackson or Jefferson Davis that are villainized now, but uh, people that are really behind this movement, uh, the people that have really stoked the fires uh, during the pandemic, uh, during those, those uh, literal fires that burned across America that nobody was uh, hardly ever prosecuted for, by the way, uh, that have literally tried to overturn uh, this country and what it believes, uh, they don't like U.S. Grant either. Uh, they don't like Abraham Lincoln either. Uh, they don't like uh, the racist American armies of World War I and World War II that were segregated uh, to a large extent. Uh, the founding fathers were anathema to them. These were uh, white men, uh, straight, that mostly were Christians, uh, certainly uh, honored the Bible, whatever their particular theology was, uh, you know, the idea of intersectionality, those guys would score a zero on the intersectionality uh, table. So the point is that when you start canceling history and history makers, um, you know, it never really stops. Ultimately, and that was my point a moment ago about the French revolutionaries. Ultimately, what tends to happen in uh, in God's creation is you wind up getting canceled yourself. You wind up having it come back down on you because those principles are poison and they're not good for anyone. As opposed to a Christian worldview and uh, a society with a Christian ethos, Judeo-Christian uh, you know, doctrines and, and practices, legal practices and, and so forth that are followed, uh, that's designed to be something that is a, a blessing to all, uh, even the foreigner even the person that does not hold to uh, the Christian beliefs. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so lastly, as our um, last big topic, I'd like to, real quick, ask, uh, talk about a man whose ground upon which he walked is worshipped by Republican to Democrat, black to white, young to old, just about every demographic, except the glaring exception with a lot of homeschoolers. Um, I'm, of course, talking about Abraham Lincoln. Uh, what most people think is that old honest Abe was a you know a god honoring non tyrannical loving kind and patriotic president whose sole aim was to keep the union together, despite the southern states having every right in the world to secede from the union as it had been understood to be the case for all states since the founding fathers. Uh, what most people don't know is that Lincoln was a student of Henry Clay and Alexander Hamilton's teaching. Those two men were both advocates for large government, central banking, internal improvements, i.e. government subsidies, which are almost all, if not all, unconstitutional, and proponents of an all-powerful federal government. Uh, a far cry from the founders' intention of a small, limited government whose purpose was to ensure that all Americans' freedoms were kept, not taken away. Gotta take a breath there. So, can you succinctly, uh, yet as thoroughly as possible, you know, give us a history of Abraham Lincoln and perhaps a few examples as to why just just maybe he wasn't the greatest uh, president in all of American history whose shrine we must bow down to. Well, you know, amen. And, you know, the fact that you would ask that question, uh, Adam, as part of your program here just is, is a very encouraging to me. And folks that are watching this should be encouraged that, uh, you know, things don't necessarily get worse and worse. I mean, we get we get a little pessimistic. We think anything that's good is just going to go down eventually. And, and yes, it's true that people, they'll take the greatest institutions and eventually run them in the ground. That includes churches, you know, seminaries, colleges, whatever. But on the other hand, God is not going to stand by and not replace, improve, or replenish those with, with new alternatives. And so, 
you know, that question that you asked is not a question that would have been asked in the good old days of the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, whatever. That's a question that your generation and some closer to my generation have dug up and uh, dare to approach uh, the sainted, you know, consecrated Lincoln. It's an important topic. And those that have read the war between the states know that we give a lot of ink to Abraham Lincoln. We're not setting out uh, to do a hit piece. We're not setting out to do anything that's not true. In fact, my original uh, intent, Adam, with that book was to have a section on Lincoln. But as we explored and we studied over a period of five and a half years, it was the, the time that we devoted to the, just that book. Uh, we realized that, it, that he was such an important person in our nation's history, and particularly that era, uh, and so multifaceted. And there were so many things about him, influences he had across the array of the American social, political, economic spectrum, that we wound up uh, breaking it into numerous different uh, features that were that were spread throughout the latter two thirds of the book. And uh, by the way, just that one topic right there, it, folks, if you haven't read The War Between the States, America's Uncivil War, just get it to read about Lincoln. Have to give uh, great affection and thanks and respect to uh, great scholars like Thomas DiLorenzo, economics professor of uh, Loyola College in Maryland and others who who were uh, streams of thought and, and uh, information I drew from as I did this. But to, to directly answer your question, Abraham Lincoln uh, did not save the Constitution, did not save the country. He destroyed the original one and uh, turned it into something different. Even James McPherson, a great Lincoln fan, a great establishment historian, uh, although he certainly is not uh, the uh, the crazed radical uh, his, historian of you know that we see in the modern era, uh, he would be kind of a middle of the road uh, centrist Democrat type person. Uh, and he's talked about. In fact, I think he wrote a book called "The Second American Revolution," in which he lauded what Lincoln did. Uh, but to get back to your original question of what were some of the things about our book that were different or upturned existing understandings and myths and stuff. One of those, uh, you know, has to do with the fact that Lincoln, uh, the, the supposed great emancipator, did everything he could to keep from black people uh, getting equal constitutional rights in this country. People say, well, yeah, uh, you know, he wanted, uh, uh, he did not want slavery to extend westward. Well, yeah, that's true. In fact, he and his lieutenants Stanton and Seward, they didn't want black people to extend westward. That's why they wanted slavery out west. They didn't want slaveholders. They didn't want black people uh, in the west. Uh, we talk about at length how Lincoln and other leaders in the Union government of that time uh, were trying to get black folks freed so they could then be shipped out to Africa uh, the nation of Liberia that was created for that to place American former slaves uh, in freedom back in Africa. Uh, the uh, Caribbean uh, country uh, nations in the Caribbean, as well as Central and South America, uh, Lincoln and, and his fellow travelers uh, were all about freeing the slaves and then shipping them out of America. And you can read about that in books such as uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln's uh Forced White Dream uh, that was written by a, a, an NAACP luminary who was aghast that Lincoln had been passed off as this great uh, friend of the slaves uh, and the black race. So I've kind of lost track with what your original question was. I think it was about Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and you have to be careful because even a lot of our friends, maybe even people watching this, this, uh, this program, Adam, people that we would normally agree with, these are some conservative colleges, conservative Christian colleges, some conservative Christian radio talk hosts and others, some conservative Christian preachers that we would agree with 99% of the time, uh, they have uh, you know, kind of been misled into this hagiography of Lincoln as the great Christian president, uh, friend to the downtrodden slaves. You know, that movie that came out a few years ago by Spielberg, Lincoln, once again, it was it was almost the it was almost diametrically uh, at odds with the truth on many of the big points in that uh, in, that actually happened in history in that movie, such as the 13th Amendment, uh, making it look like Lincoln was the spearhead of that. He was actually against that. 
So, uh, you know, when he was killed, and we quote this in the book, uh, there were some some very interesting quotes from some of the radical Republican leaders, and that was what they called themselves, the radical Republican wing uh, at that point in history that the Republican Party, the party of Lincoln, uh, they, they looked at Lincoln's death as a great advantage because they would be able to push across uh, the truly radical socialistic, if not communist, um, uh, uh, vision that they had for the South and for the country. So, closing thought here, we talk about hardball politics in this day and time. We talk about how people are actually trying to ruin the lives of their opponents. This is nothing new. We talk about in the war between the states. The presidential election of 1864 may have been thrown. It may have been stolen as well. McClellan may very possibly have won that election over Lincoln. We break that down. So, uh, you know, there's nothing new under the sun, Solomon said. There have been crooked people trying to do bad things in this country for a long time, but fortunately there have been great heroic men and women, patriots that have stood up for the right. They may not have gotten their faces on money or their names on calendars and national holidays, but God in God's reckoning, his history books, they're the heroes. And so I compliment you on following in that, uh, that legacy of honor and uh, courage, Adam, as you seek to get the truth out about what really happened in our history and let the chips fall where they may. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Dwyer. That is very complimentary. I'm flattered. Thank you so much for um, coming on the show. I know you've got to run, so I'll let you go. Um, there's so much more we could talk about. We're trying to summarize a whole period in American history in 30 minutes, but thank you so much. I appreciate it. Where can people go? Where should people go if they want to uh, check out The War Between the States and any of your other books? Well, thanks for answering that. I know in Virginia there, uh, Rex Miller, the Confederate shop, I uh, think it's in Richmond, but somewhere there in Virginia is a great place to get it. Uh, our website, John J, that's middle initial J, John J Dwyer, D-W-Y-E-R, John J Dwyer.com. You can get it there, but we encourage you to get it anywhere. If you've got Books A Million, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, support these places. Let them know that people want to read this kind of book. Uh you know, they don't just have bad stuff. If we will buy the material, they will get it out there and other people will read it. So there are a lot of places you can get the book. And uh, it's a study guide that is also available, a companion study guide that homeschoolers such as your family have been using for a long time now. So, uh, you know, you can reach me, anybody watching this, if you have questions or want more information about our other books or just want to talk uh, through our website uh, directly. And I thank you again for the privilege to come on here. I'll be honest, this is one of my favorite interviews I've done, maybe ever, certainly in a long time, maybe ever. I'm jazzed. This topic gets me fired up in case you couldn't tell. And like I said, I was serious <laughs> in the interview. There is so, so, so much more that we could talk about. We're trying to summarize, like I said, an entire period of history in 30 or 35 minutes. So I do hope to have Mr. Dwyer back on the show. We were talking for just a second. He had to go, but just a second after the recording ended that he was saying, you know, if we want to do it again sometime, we should. And yes, absolutely. Maybe we'll talk more about Lincoln specifically next time. It's a topic I'm very passionate about because the truth needs to get out. And so I highly recommend if you want a very comprehensive, truthful, and all-encompassing guide to the Civil War and Abraham Lincoln, go to johnjdwyer.com, check out his books. And then if you want to buy it somewhere, you know, like if you have a Prime membership, if you want to buy it off of Amazon, go ahead. But I highly recommend The War Between the States by John Dwyer. Thank you so much for watching, folks, and let's get that out card rolling. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Fight and Revive with Adam Boyer. We're already being shadow banned on YouTube. So if you would like this specific video and then subscribe to the channel, that would be greatly appreciated and help us reach more people. Thank you for watching.